hello, assalamu alaikum. Hello, I'm very good, Leila. How are you? Fine, alhamdulillah. How are you? Very well. So excited to be talking to you today. Oh, I can see lots of people joining us, which is fabulous. And nice. I, really, this is the place to be on a, where are we? Thursday afternoon. There is nowhere better to be right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Leila, I'm going to dive right in because I know we've only got a half an hour um, to, to spend with you today and we really want to get the most out of this time with you. Um, obviously, we're here today to discuss your beautiful new novel, which sadly I don't have with me because I'm traveling. Can you believe? Yeah, I knew you'd come to the <laughs> to the. <rest. laughs> oh, I love the hardback. How beautiful. I, mean, I think the cover deserves a moment of of recognition as well. Absolutely beautiful cover, and I love I love both the one that you've got here and uh, in the US as well. So stunning. Um, but let's just dr dive straight into this. I want you to tell the to the viewers about River Spirit. Um, it's your new book. We had the wonderful launch at SOAS the other day, which was in such a, you know, in the spirit of the book, I think. It was uh, reflective. It was um, informative. I learned so much just listening to you, which was exactly what I got out of the book as well. I love listening to you talk about each of the characters female characters we'll get into all of that I'll just remind um, viewers as well that if you have comments questions please put your questions in the comments and I'll try and pick them up as we go along um, but yes Leila tell us about uh, the book tell us uh, give an introduction to those who don't know what River Spirit is about well it's actually a love story really <laughs> to be honest so it is a love story um, and the couple kind of, uh, because of the war and everything, they're together, they're apart, and, and there's different reasons that they're together or they're apart. Sometimes it's to do with the war, sometimes to do with themselves. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the, the, the woman is just too young. She's a child, starts off with her as an as a, as a 11-year-old uh, girl, a Kwane, in South Sudan. So um, the structure of the novel is, is, is a historical fiction, and it's um, it follows this couple, you know. Th you can read it that way. Uh, you can also read it uh, as um, you know, as 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 a, a commentary on the British Empire, as a you know, a political uh, way of of uh, of us rewriting our history. You know, showing um, the, the the history from the Sudanese point of view rather than from the you know the colonizers' uh, point of view, because at the end of the novel. Uh, the, it, it ends with the British invasion uh, uh, of Sudan, and Sudan becomes part of the of the of the British Empire. So it really shows uh, the, the reader uh, the um, you know the um, you know how that came uh, came about. Yeah, I, I and I just love that. I mean, I I read the book. I loved the book. I really thought you just kicked it out of the ballpark with this one. Um, the last book I read of yours obviously was your previous book, Bird Summons, and they're so different to one another. So I was also curious to know, how do you go from writing a book like Bird Summons, which is very contemporary, it has some historical, you know, um, uh, references in there, um, but it, it is very much a contemporary story. It's about the melting pot that the UK is. You've got magical realism in there. And then you bring us along to River Spirit and it's a completely different place. You're giving us historical fiction um, at, with a romance at, the, at, at, at its center as well, but lots of political machination. You give us Islamic theology, you give us, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned there just now, like, you know, the Sudanese view that, that counters the colonialist, imperialist um, writing of history. But what I loved is that you were really disrupting um, another kind of, uh, rose-tinted romanticized view of history which is that of the Ottoman um, history as well which it, you know is in the current zeitgeist is is really very popular amongst Muslims especially especially with series like Ertrugul out there and stuff so I felt like you gave us a really I, I really thought it was subversive in many many ways but but how do you do that I mean that's such a it's such a impressive breadth of writing that you give us from bird summons to river spirit i mean how do you do i just want to know how you do that <laughs> like what is the process how do you go from bird summons to river spirit it's a long time many years there's kind of years in between i guess 
But uh, the thing is, the bird summons was very much about Scotland. And also, the spirit has this Scottish Sudan connection, which is what I want, because I've been living now in Scotland, uh, you know, the same t number of years I've lived in, in Sudan. And I feel now that I belong to both places and that I want to bring them together. And one of the things I discovered when I was researching is that we grew up in Sudan uh, uh, thinking that the Ingles, the English were in Sudan, the English ruled us. But actually a lot of the, the, the men in the administration were Scottish. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. So, so when I found this out, it's suddenly like, wow, you know, uh, these are people I know, you know, these are like the young men who went, went with my uh, son to university. And, and, and so I felt the kind of a closest to them. So why would these young Scottish men go out there to Sudan? Because for many of them, uh, you know, they come from a working class background. They, 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 they're not connected. They, they don't, you know, they're not the sons of so-and-so and so-and-so. So, -and -so, -and -so. so the, the colonies is a way for them to make their mark. It's a way of them to come up in, in the world. And when I saw it that way, I felt a great deal of sympathy towards them and I, kind of an understanding to, to, towards them. So I wanted to have this also connection uh, to, in, in, in the book through the character of the artist who goes there and he's the one who then, he, he wants to paint Aquani and he can't, he, he can't have access to her except when he actually buys her. And even though he's against slavery, he, he does that because, you know, his ambition as, a, as an artist overpowers his, uh, you know, misgivings. Mm. And I love that. So you, you referenced that point in the book where Robert is trying to, to capture her through his painting. And he's incapable of it. In her eyes, it's what has he drawn? What has he painted? You know, I mean, when he brings those paintings back to the UK, you know, he's expecting that they will be appreciated and give a glimpse, a window into Sudan. But she sees it as completely vacant and vacuous, doesn't she? So I feel like even in that, there's a commentary that you're giving us. Yeah, this is where this, this, this is sort of a culture clash where that she doesn't really ap appreciate being part of this. And she feels the exploitation, even though... Uh, it's not presented as exploitation, but she feels actually the exploitation. And we know now that all these Orientalist painters, uh, all these uh, paintings of the harems and uh, the women, you know, uh, reclining and, and smoking, all these were kind of like fake because a lot of these artists, uh, they could not have possibly had access to women's uh, quarters in, in such conservative societies. So they ended up either... Uh, you know, uh, painting enslaved women or uh, or prostitutes. And so it was all a fantasy. It was part of this Orientalist fantasy. It was not really the truth. You know, the truth was that, that these women, you know, some of them didn't want to be painted and they were kind of forced in, into it. Mm, amazing. And so speaking of the truth, one of the, I mean, the, the catalyzing sort of situation that arises politically is the rise of the Mahdi in, uh, in Sudan. This was so fascinating for me. Honestly, Leila, I feel like I know something of Islamic history, but this was entirely new to me. So I had heard about a movement, I think it was in the 80s, I want to say, um, in Saudi, where there was a man who claimed to be the Mahdi. And the, I mean, that's an untold wild story in itself. Maybe you'll give us a historical fiction around that one day um, and the siege of Mecca, which is just absolutely crazy. But I had never heard about the situation in Sudan. So, and this, I love this when a historical fiction sends me down rabbit holes, Google rabbit holes, and you totally did that for me. I mean, for those people who are not nerdy, you don't need to go down a rabbit hole on Google to appreciate this book because you give us all the context in the book. But can you tell, you know, potential readers and those who have read the, read the book a little bit about um, what the Mahdi means for sort of in Islamic theology and then what it was in this particular Sudanese context in the 1800s? So I start, there's um, the beginning of the book starts with uh, the, the, the quotations from the hadith, you know, from um, Musad Ahl al-Hadith and Sunan Abu Dawood, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks about the Mahdi coming at the end of time. Mm. And saying that he is going to have, his name is going to be like my name and he's going to have these features and he's going to come from the, from my, uh, you know, from a household. And there's, there's descriptions of, of the, the expected Mahdi coming at the end of time, at a time of earthquakes, at a time of uh, difficult times. Mm. So throughout Islamic history, only 30 men came, made this claim. 
You know, one of them, as you mentioned, the, 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 the Saudi one in the 70s. And, 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 and so this was one of them. And usually in times of stress, and I was told that even in, uh, in Iraq during the war, uh, there, there was these holy men saying they had powers and, and so on. Not, not saying they were the Mahdi, but in times of stress, uh, people start to believe. You know, they want to believe in a miracle. They want to believe that somebody will, will, will have powers to save them. Uh, so usually these things fizzle out. In the case of Sudan, um, he, had, uh, he had a following. And the, and, the, um, uh, and the Ottoman Empire was very cruel to these. To, this was very much, we are now at the edges of the Ottoman Empire. The, <laughs> all these beautiful soaps we watch yeah. is in the center of Istanbul where everything is all nice and fine. But this is really in the, in the you know, the exploited hinterlands. So, uh, so the people were, were, were oppressed. They were felt they were, you know, suffering from an injustice. And so they followed him and they rose against the, 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 the Turks. And because the, 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 the empire was crumbling, the armies that were sent out against him uh, couldn't defeat him. So, so uh, the, the, uh, you know, so he gained followers and he started winning, you know, village after village, city after city, um, until he took over the, the, the capital, which is what happens in, 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 in the novel. So the, the ulama in Khartoum, who were educated and who had had the Azhar education and they were part of the official um, establishment, they, um, you know, tested him. They said, okay, well, you say that you are, you claim that you are the Mahdi. Let's see if you fulfill the conditions that we have in, in, in the books, in the hadith and so on. And they came to the conclusion that he wasn't the, 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 the real uh, Mahdi. And so they issued fatwas against him, saying to the people, don't follow this guy. This guy is not the real expected uh, Mahdi. He does not fulfill the conditions. Uh, but they were, um, the, the, the attack against them was that, well, of course, you're going to say that because you, you, you're supping with the Sultan. You're part of the government, you know, so of course you, you're saying that. But, but I felt, um, you know, reading the, 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 the history, I felt a great admiration for them. That they were the ones, you know, that they, they were educated, they were following the, you know, the books, they were, you know, um, sticking to their line up, up until the very end. And, and they are, uh, you know, they're persecuted and, and that's described in, in, in the book. Uh, because the movement starts off being very idealistic and, 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 and so on. And then it just goes down a very bad, violent fanaticism and everything. And so they were right uh, to start with. Mm. So when I was at your um, launch the other day at SOAS, you said something about when you write a historical fiction, you're not making a commentary on the current situation. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not trying to, you know, run parallels. But you so easily do, you know, there's so much in what you were writing where I was like, oh, Layla's some saying something about this right now. And oh, Layla's definitely making a comment about that right now. But <laughs> How much of that do you think is maybe subconsciously from you and also just from the fact that as human beings, we're just constantly repeating cycles because, you know, like in this situation, I didn't know any of this history or because history is never a neutral practice, is it? You know, this who the version of history that we all come to know is very much about, you know, the politics of power. Knowledge production is a political um process and you spoke about this as well the other day at SOAS about you know um sort of almost having a, a almost a bipolar a, you know a double experience of the history of of Sudan during that period where uh, in schools you might learn one thing and at home you might hear a different thing um so I guess what I'm asking here really is sort of the power of history to teach us in the here and now even as that's not the objective with which you came into telling the story. Yes, it was not the objective, but I could see the parallels. Even as I was writing, I was just, oh dear, this is how it starts. So yes. it starts with a sense of injustice, a deep sense of injustice. Mm -hmm. And then the feeling then that this injustice gives the, the people, the feeling that their uh, rulers, sh you know, they, they're so harsh, they're so cruel, they can't be Muslims then. So that is very dangerous. This is now, this is, this is a tipping dangerous point. Once they reach the stage of saying that the ruler who is Muslim is not a Muslim, this gives them the green light to go to war against the ruler, 
to, to, to really rise up against the ruler. And, and, and as at what happened in the book, for example, even women whose husbands, uh, the Mahdi was saying in Al Ubayy that the women whose husbands were part of the, of the colonial army, they are not, the, their marriages are ab abrogated ah. because they're married to an infidel. So once, once he, once somebody is accused of this, once a Muslim is accused of being an infidel, that is a, is, is a very serious, very catastrophic thing because it, it, it has these repercussions. Mm -hmm. And so the chaos then starts to, 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 to spread where they, they are, they're actually, um, you know, um, killing, uh, the uh, other Muslims on the basis of the fact that they are not Muslims and therefore we, we know we have a right to, 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 to kill them. And this, this then, uh, this is how these movements then become more and more violent, more and more fanatical and more and more parochial. They just start to fall into themselves mm -hmm. because lose, they've lost then any kind of, uh, you know, uh, ability to, to, to see the world as it is now. Um, and so the book really, in a, in a way, um, supports the, 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 the ulama of the government, which is nowadays people are so sneering of them, you know, but they're the ones who, 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 who have the common sense. They're the ones who, um, you know, uh, they, they, they can tell that these, yes, there's been an injustice, but two, right, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> And I feel like I've talked a little too much about the, the uh, political machinations of the time and the history and things, because really at the center of it are these incredible women though as well. And that's another fantastic, absolutely brilliantly executed, you know, part of this book is how you center women. And often in these sorts of histories, it, it again, it's the men's narratives that come to the fore. It's the political narratives that come to the fore. Um, what, what happens to those women? Um, what happened to their experience? I mean, you, you mentioned there that, you know, women who were married to men who were seen as being part of the establishment, then marriages were considered annulled. We see the impact of that in a Kwame and Zamzam uh, and what happens to her. So tell us about the female characters of this book and why it was important for you to, to bring them uh, into the light. Well, they're, they're only like mentioned, if you're reading the, 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 the sources in the history, they're like footnotes and um, they're mentioned kind of vaguely that, oh, women were part, they were part of the wars, they traveled with the armies, they, 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 you know, they supported the army all the way through, they, they also worked in espionage and, and they did spying and things like that. So all of that actually is, a, is it, for the creative writer, that is a gift because then it, it allows your imagination to, to, to grow. And then you are really, um, you know, um, able to invent these, these characters and fill in the gaps. So you, you feel then as a, as a creative writer that you're filling in the gaps because the, the, these gaps are, are not there in the, in the hysteri historical record. And so you're, you're using your imagination to, 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 to fill the gaps, which is, which is, which is, a, was an enjoyable uh, thing uh, to do. And also writing about the woman kind of made me step back from the violence that it doesn't have to be so much of description of battles and violence and, and, and politics that we can then go into, uh, you know, the, um, the more, um, you know, uh, domestic scenes, the more, uh, you know, um, the love, the family love and, and all that. So that was, this was a, a nice to, to do. <laughs> what came through as well with the women was their resourcefulness, you know, so that they are in, and, and we all know that as soon as there's war or uh, devastation of any kind, natural disasters, it's always women and children who are the most vulnerable in those situations. And I think that's probably been the case throughout time. Um, and so, you know, you don't dilute any of that through the book, but you do also show the resourcefulness of women, the tenacity of women, the ability, the resilience, the strength. Um, and for me, I thought that's what you meant or were referring to when you titled the book River Spirit. So I know, uh, again, at your launch the other day, there was quite a bit of discussion about what is the River Spirit. But, and for me, I thought the River Spirit was very much in line with who Zamzam Akwami is and because she was just constantly pulled back to the water. She couldn't, because she had grown up in a village where, she, you know, the, the Nile ran through. And I thought, you know, of course, of, of course, you know, the, the river spirit is referring to Akwami and the women around her and the way that you flow through everything that comes before you, just as the Nile continues to flow through various types of lands. Um, 
and the conditions. So I wanted to ask you, um, for the for the benefit of the those who are watching, what did River Spirit mean to you when you were titling the book, and did it go through different iterations of, of titles? Um, I meant it more as a, as a spirit, as we was, we would say, the spirit of the revolution, not not really as a as a kind of a, a being uh, or or that. Although, as that they were discussing that that in the south of Sudan there are uh, people who believe in in the river spirits, and it could be then that Akwani was uh, you know um, brought up in this kind in this religion where you know there's a, there's a belief in in the river uh, spirits. Um, but the book is not it's not like that it's it doesn't go into this kind of uh, metaphysical line at all it's 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 it's, it's quite uh, down down to earth i find it extremely difficult i've 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 always uh, get stuck with uh, with uh, with problems with my title i always change my my titles um i i think only maybe lyrics alley was the only title i ever just came up with <laughs> Editor, was it your editor's um, input? Yes, there, it was. It was uh, very much my editor's input, and I wanted. I didn't want to have uh, different titles in different parts of the world. I, some of my colleagues have that, and that just I find that very confusing for readers. And I've heard of people buying both copies because they they think it's two separate books. And I thought that that's that wouldn't be fair for for the readers. Yeah. I like Comment in the in the in the comments below. Uh, Meet Amber Khan has says, "Okay, now I'm confused about which book to read first, first <laughs> River Spirit. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't know which one you should go for first, but just make sure you've bought both of them. That's all I would say <laughs> on that." <laughs> Leila, um, if you have like, because you've got this amazing catalogue of books now that you've written, do you have a favourite amongst them yourself? Oh, the famous is always the newest one because it feels like it's the youngest one. It's like you have children and this is the youngest child. And you're still, it's still just appearing in the world and you want to kind of give it the, the needs your tender, loving care. So I guess that's my favorite at the moment. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I would have to add, that, you know, while people are out there buying all of your books, that they must buy the kindness of um, enemies because that was just exquisite. I mean, that was another historical fiction where you brought a history that is hardly ever discussed or known about into the fore, and I absolutely love that. Now, I have to be fair to those who um, submitted questions before today's live and actually ask some of their questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Selfish and kept you to myself, but there was a question. So we've talked about the women in, in the book, but there's a specific question that said, there are so many inspirational women in River Spirit. Which women inspire you? And do you have a favorite character? Oh, I, of course, I spent a lot of time with Aquania. And so I, I, I felt very close to her all through, all through the, the, the book. And uh, uh, I was kind of like hanging around with her a long time. And then Salha kind of appeared. Mm -hmm. at later in the book and she's very domineering and I felt that she kind of like took over in a way <laughs> and I based I based the character of Salha on my dad's doctor it's my dad uh, in his in his last years of life he got vascular dementia in Sudan and his doctor was this lovely uh, young uh, youngish Sudanese uh, doctor who had trained in the UK and she had just come back from the UK to Sudan and she had this amazing voice and, and, and I liked how she would speak to my dad and I liked how he, he responded so well to her and, and, and just her voice. And, 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 and so when, um, when he passed away, actually, she came to, 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 you know, to pay her condolences and the house was full of people. And when I saw her walk in, I just burst into tears. And, I, and everybody was wondering, why is Layla upset? Who is this woman? Why is Layla just completely losing it over her and they all then then, then they were told oh she was you know her dad's doctor and so her, she's got this voice and her voice stays with me and and you know sometimes I phone her and I like hearing her voice and so her voice just went into the novel and that's why the the the, the Salha chapters is all letters because it's her voice her voice her voice ringing in my ear and so um that's how it it, uh, it came about so she's she's also very uh, you know uh, close to my heart <laughs> um, 
for that. Well, I love when there's like a really personal sort of touch within a story. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Leila. Um, there is a question in the comments below again, this time from Rosina Ahad. Um, she's asking, what does the writing process look like for you, Leila? Oh, well, the writing process is me like be being very nervous of the blank page and wanting uh, to, to, to find a flow. So I'm always looking for, a, for an opening line. I'm always looking for a, a tense that will give, give me this flow. So I'm kind of like searching around, searching around. And once I get it, I'm happy because then I can run with it. So at the beginning, there's a kind of like an uncomfortable feeling of, you know, how am I going to start? So the beginning of the book is, is, very, is, is the most difficult part for me. So, uh, but then once I do the first uh, 10,000 words, I'm happy. 20,000 words, that's it. I'm in heaven. You know, that's, um, I feel like I'm, 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 I've reached it. I'm happy. And then I just keep, everything else goes smoothly after that. So it's just a matter of finding my stride, finding the, the, the you know, tapping in and trying to find the, 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 the voice that's, that's going to that's gonna work. Because sometimes things frizzle out. Sometimes mm. I come up with a sentence. Oh, that's a good sentence. Fall asleep, wake up in the morning. I can't even remember what, I, what it was. So yeah. it, can't have been great. I think, oh, it can't have been great. Forget it. <laughs> There's lots of things that frizzle out, frizzle out, frizzle out, and then I want, but I want something that is going to sustain, you know, for the for the long run. Mm, amazing. Actually, I'm interested then in the chronology of how you write as well, because the book opens up. I mean, literally, you throw us right in, and it's just. I mean, the first few pages, I was hooked and I was so angry with having a full-time job because I did not want to be working I wanted to just be reading River Spirit I was like this job is a nuisance for goodness sake um because you, you open up with this scene and you don't know names there are no names or well, not initially and there's just this woman and you know that she's escaping to go and give the Mahdi a message so you just throw us in is that where you started when you were writing the book or what, what was your first you know no. like the first was the Akwani in chapter one, where she's in the river and all that. And then this Rabha, the, the running and all that, was chapter nine. Oh. And so I thought, oh, all my books start off so gently. And maybe I need to do something different this time. I need to, you know, hit the ground running. So what do I do? What do I do? And I thought, oh, maybe I should take something from the middle and put it up in front. And so this chapter then seemed the most logical thing because Rabha is just one she appears in one chapter mm. you, know, you know her story from the beginning to, to, to the end is all one chapter and she never appears again so i thought okay well that's it that i'll use that as the prologue and uh, and, and it, it worked so that's good i'm happy about that <laughs> started off um writing as a short story writer and i actually haven't read any of your short story collections yet which obviously i need to i need to you know, mend my ways and make sure I go and read them now. But um, when I read that first part, I thought your prologue, I thought, ah, I can see, I can see Layla's strength as a short story writer as well. It really came through because as you said, Rabha doesn't come up again. But do you think you might write a story about Rabha? Because there was a part of me that was like, I want to know her backstory and I want to know more about her. Do you think you'll ever do that? I want to write a short story about the, 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 the tall, skinny lady who was selling the peanuts. She sells the peanuts. And then she's, the, she's, a, she's, a, she's a spy. And she, she, she goes, she's sent as an ambassador to Gordon in the palace. And, I, and, and this is mentioned kind of briefly in the novel. And I thought, no, I need to do something more with that. And maybe just have a story all about her and how she goes to the palace and how she faces the, you know, this British general and all that, that would be quite a, a good story to, to, to write. So I, that's, that's one of the, the, the pieces in the book. Sometimes, yeah, you write a novel and there's little things that you feel that mm, you want to say more about them. Mm. And that moves you on to a short story or that moves you on to another, sometimes another, another novel. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Leila, we did say half an hour, but I know I've got permission from you to go a little bit over time. So I'm going to exercise that now because we do have more questions coming through and I'd love to get through um, as well as questions that were submitted previously. So I'll go to um, one from the comments and then I'll go to the one that we had before. So this hybrid reads, she's asking, is there another book in the pipeline? <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> I need a break. 
Yeah, I imagine that the research process um, for this would have taken a long time to, to research River Spirit. And correct me if I'm wrong, did you, did you not find somewhere in the archives um, a receipt or something that had the name of a woman, Zamzam? Tell us about that. Yeah, I went to the Sudan archives in Durham University and they had this bill of sale for a, for, a, for a slave girl and her name was Zamzam. And I had known that slavery existed in Sudan, but just to see the bill of sale and the amounts and the names of the men, it was just shocking and it just brought it so much to, 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 to life. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was a petition raised against uh, an enslaved woman who ran away. She stole a piece of material from her mistress and ran away. And when she ran away, she went back to the previous uh, ma um, uh, master. So that seemed to be like very uh, kind of a, a strange thing to do. Why would she do that? Why wouldn't she just run away, away, you know? Um, wh why, w why would she do that? And so it, 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 uh, it put the seed in my mind of this of this of this uh, story. Um, so these two things were were, were kind of like real uh, sort of primary sources that that uh, I held in my hand and that inspired the the story in, of of Aquani. Yeah. Oh wow! So that beginning of of River Spirit, how incredible! Um, there's another question from Samra Abbas. She's saying salam. Super excited to buy this book. Good, good, Samra. That's what we want everyone here to be doing, is buying this incredible book. And review it, please, everyone. People buy books, but you must review them. Go, go, you know, go on Goodreads, Amazon, uh, the Story Graph. Make sure you're leaving reviews everywhere, too. Um, but she's asking, what inspired you to start a career in writing? Oh, well, I was, uh, I just moved to Scotland, and I had... Uh, a four four year old son. I had a two weeks old baby, <laughs> and my husband was working on the oil rigs. And I felt very homesick. I was very homesick. I had uh, started a PhD and I in statistics, and I it didn't work out. Everything was just like not going. I was going through a bad time in my life. So I used to go to the library and I used to read a lot of books and and kind of like uh, think and and then some. And then I thought, oh well, maybe I could think uh, write a short story one day so I did that and then I did so in those days of course in the 90s there was no such thing as online courses we <laughs> had things called correspondence courses and you used to get do it all by mail you know you post you you write your story you type it you put it in the post and, and I did all that and it was very good I got good feedback and then I started to go to a workshop in Aberdeen University and people were so friendly and nice. And, and one thing kind of led, led uh, to, to, to the other and, and things took off from, from, from there. So that was good. <laughs> uh, and I love that it started from a story of turmoil. And I think one that a lot of, especially women who have experienced motherhood, I think it's one that a lot of us would resonate with that time when your babies are all so little, and especially if you move location to a completely new place where you don't really have friends or family or ne a social network around you. So to, to take that kind of loneliness and, you know, um, uh, isolation, I suppose, in a way, and to turn that into, you know, your writing, what, what a beautiful story. I really hope that inspires others who may be, may be watching and listening today um, or later on. Um, there's another brilliant question here from Rooted Writer. Um, she's asked, how do you navigate the challenge of writing what you want to write about and what the publisher's trends are? I think that's a great question. Because mm -hmm. that's, a, <laughs> that's a good, good question. Well, I mean, you, you, uh, I'm, I'm lucky that my publishers are, you know, uh, on the same page as we, uh, no, they, 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 you know, they, they we're, we're together. We're, we're thinking, you know, on the same uh, line. You only need one publisher. You know, what I mean, Who, why do you want? Well, I mean, one publisher in each language or in each uh, territory. You don't really, you don't have to have the, the support of of, of, of all uh, publishers. Um, I guess it's difficult for people like us who are not writing that something that's very commercial. You know. Um, but 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 we um, we we help each other. I think we you know we support we we support each other. And um, there was a time in the past when even even I was I mean I was alive when people said oh black people don't read who's gonna read uh, 
who's going to lead Alice Walker, who's going to lead uh, Toni Morrison. When Toni Morrison, apparently when she first came to the UK, or was it Alice Walker, she was in a very small bookshop. She was published by the women's press, which is a very small press. And she was, you know, in a very small bookshop. And, and, and she was not in the Royal Festival Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, so... And that is the same for, for, for many of the, the you know, the, the early African uh, writers as well. Um, so, you know, things are, 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 are better, but, 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 but still, we, you know, when you're writing from, from specifically from within your tradition, you know, from within your own culture, uh, it's still, you're still an outsider in a way. Mm. And, um, and, and, and so it's, it's, um, um, you know, it's it's harder to to get the the the, the attention or the the sales of of, of the mainstream, uh, but but it's important that that such books do get written and that they do sort of exist because we know that that that, that our history is rich and that we know that that uh, um, you know we have so much stories that we want to tell from our own per particular uh, perspective. Mm. And so I think by by attention, I think it's really important to. Remember, there's a responsibility on us as readers as well, because um, publishing trends are about what the readers want. It's a supply and demand, uh, you know, sort of dynamic. So us as readers, I think it's really important that we do support publishers like Safi who are making space for your kinds of books and who aren't insisting that you dilute things. Or I mean, I found it fascinating the other day when we, we were at your your um, launch and the i'm sorry the gentleman that that was um hosting you i've forgotten his name but he'd written a period and he said that his publishers insisted on putting a picture of general gordon on the front of it and, and I, I was just like a gasp i thought is that not the perfect metaphor for, for publishing you know like the history of sudan but we're going to put the white guy on the front of the cover, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that's why it's important that we do support publishers like Safi and you know, get onto their, uh, you know, they've got mailing lists, uh, follow them on Instagram and e everywhere else. So, yeah, I think I think we also as readers have a responsibility to be supporting publishers like that and authors like yourself. And, and that's really through buying these books, through reviewing these books and getting the word out as much as possible and i think especially for those of us who have platforms where we are specifically talking about books whether that's on bookstagram or twitter or tiktok or wherever it is that you know we center we center these um authors and and publishers so i'm going to wrap up with one last question because i know um we have gone over time but i did want to honor all the questions that came to us beforehand as well. So someone asked, there is a neutrality and empathy to the way you treat each of the characters in River Spirit, even when tackling the characters who you might call antagonistic. Why did you choose to write the novel this way? I, I have to agree. I love the, 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 you give us all the information and then you leave us to make our decisions on, on what, we, what we make of each of the people. So could you, could you um, talk about that? Why the neutrality? And, why choose to narrate the novel this way? Well, I just, I felt like out of respect for all the sides involved, you know, I, I, I felt that I wanted to, uh, to, 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 to show their perspective as, as well and not to be dismissive of, of, of any one kind of uh, uh, point of view. So that's why I had also the, the, you know, the character of the young man who joins the Mahdi and who becomes this kind of fundamentalist. And I wanted to see the world from his uh, point of view of you and um it, it felt to me interesting to do it that way to do it to to, to 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 you know to have all these different points of view and to and to to, to kind of get inside their head and and to to see the situation from uh, from their point of view but of course at the end you do see my own um you know my my position is, is kind of clear it goes all the way uh, clear but uh but i i still wanted to give the space for that and it gives the novel a different uh, sort of flavor and you're, you're kind of moving from from a different uh, uh, point point of view and i think also it gives it a credibility so that you know that that, that people then i wanted i know that not everybody's gonna know about the history of sudan or gonna go and research it and so i wanted this to be a reliable source and it's actually accurate i've stuck to the historical accuracy i haven't sort of taken liberties or anything like that so that you know it's it's and and so 
I wanted also people to to be able to take away this um, this learning experience from it. I love that fiction as a reliable source. I mean, I don't think <laughs> enough people see fiction that way. So, I mean, certainly for myself, I feel like I have learned so much history through historical fiction, um, and and not only because of the details and the stories that are delivered to me through various writers, particularly yourself. Um, but it's also because you do inspire me to then go and do more research and look. I mean, um, you know, you mentioned in some of your interviews, various movies or other books. I mean, you mentioned Aisha's vision. So, um, you know, unfortunately not translated into English. I was like, ooh, I need to get my hands on that. But, you know, like you give us this wealth of the references to go and look into. And I'm so grateful that we live in a time where we have wonderful books but we also have you know means like this where we can talk to you and hear more about your own um ref you know sources and your own um inspirations around these stories so thank you yeah. yeah thank you no no thank you so much for that that's that's that's, that's really true i think that we're we're uh, part of the challenge now is not to be uh, sucked into you know just only reading the bestsellers and 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 all that, but actually that we go and 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 read the books that 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 uh, you know matter to 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 us or that they give us a a, a different kind of uh, per perspective. Yeah, love it, love it so much. Thank you so much, Leila. As always, it is always so nourishing to speak to you. I just love being in your presence, whether that's you know virtually like this or at a launch or reading your books. So um, thank you so much for, for just the generosity of your own spirit as well. Um, thank you to everybody who has joined us today. I'm sorry if you asked a question and I missed it, but you know, read the book, buy the book, gift it to others, uh, and just enjoy and raise as much noise about as you can. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Leila. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you. Those years very you're very generous too. <laughs> and all the best with your own book too. Thank you. Everyone, you take care and see you all soon. Assalamu alaikum. Bye bye. Bye bye.